Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome back to the Arctic. We are broadcasting live as part of AXA XL Arctic Live, and this is an Arctic Q&A session with myself, Jamie, and Ellie, who's currently behind the camera. Uh, so we'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible in the next 45 minutes. Uh, we're broadcasting from the UK Arctic Research Station, and that's here in Neolisund, uh, which is the northernmost permanent community in the world. It's an international science village, and it's on the island of Svalbard, and that is halfway between the top of Norway, down there, and the North Pole, which is that way. We're actually closer to Greenland uh, than we are to Norway, uh, at 79 degrees north. Now, what we'll do is we'll have a quick peek outside, show you around, uh, and tell you about some of the surrounding um, environment, landscape, and also where we are here in the Olesund and the UK Arctic Research Station. And then we'll come back in and Ellie and myself will go through as many questions as we can uh, that you're sending through. So great to have those either sent through um, via the live chat and we'll also go through those questions that have been submitted by, via the Encounter EDU website in advance uh, so when if we're ready we are ready fantastic we'll go and have a look outside try not to trip over anything here we are maybe the winds died down a bit i had to make it marginally more pleasant um, but no. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to the view from the UK Arctic Research Station. We're looking out over the fjord here, and the fjord is the sea inlet uh, that comes running past the station and the collection of uh, buildings that is Neolisund. Um, you can see some little sort of bits of iceberg in there, and those are coming from the glacier, which you can see at the end, the uh, Kronobrin, um, the crackly edge there, bits of ice um, carving off, coming off, and the glacial snout, and then falling um, into the fjord to make icebergs. Um, that's where we've been sampling. We've done some sample sites down on the inner fjord there, and then some just behind uh, this bank of snow, and then out into the outer fjord as well, where the wind gets um, picked up a bit, and also the waves get a bit bumpier. Um, lots of amazing wildlife we've seen this time. So we've had beluga whales, minke whales, uh, blue whale, just about further out, uh, the biggest uh, creature ever to live, and then amazing um, bird life uh, and some seals as well. In past, um, we've been doing research up on the glaciers. as you can see to the side there, the Leuvenbreen, and uh, that's been really um, fantastic. So with the science community here in Neolisund, um, that mix of marine, terrestrial, and atmospheric research. And if I just bring you round uh, to this side uh, and show you the research station, so this is where we're based. So we're not based in tents or igloos when we're up here. We're based in a research station. And these are great. And there's a variety of different um, research facilities, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Uh, here we have research stations from 10 different countries, uh, Norway, Germany, France. Uh, we also have the Netherlands, Italy, UK, and then um, Japan, China, uh, South Korea, and India. Uh, and what it means is you've got bedrooms, you've got lab facilities, you've got living space, you've got hot showers, which is rather nice after a cold day out and about. Um, and also you've got some places to make tea. Very important on the British station that we can make tea. Uh, mild panic set in um, when we thought we'd run out of tea bags um, a few days ago, but luckily we found some more in a cupboard. So we'll just come back in. and set ourselves up again and see who is watching um, and give some shout outs to some of the schools and not shutting anything on the door Whew. it's definitely colder today um, definitely feels colder uh, bring this down here. 
clip on. So we have uh, schools from uh, Cyprus, the UK, Colombia, Bermuda and USA. Welcome uh, one and all. And we have some shout outs. We have a big hello from the Camden School for Girls in London. Big hello back. Hi. Um, greetings um, from INEM, Santiago Perez School in Colombia. Hi. And lovely to have you with us again. And so I'll just wait for Ellie to come and join us. Um, and so we can get her views and everything else okay. on Hi this everyone. Arctic Q&A. Ooh, it's a lot lower than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I've had to sit on that all me. week. Do you want to is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot taller than I realised. Am I? Yeah. You only work with me on how many expeditions, so, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll lean back like this. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> let's get it's started. It's a very relaxed Arctic yeah. life today. <laughs> um, we'll get started off and um, yeah, brilliant. We've got schools from all over the world, which is really, really exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm going to ask Jamie some questions in this session because you spend a lot of time asking other people questions, yes. but now it's your turn in the spotlight. Oh dear. I'm going to grill you. Um, so the very first question from INEM is, what makes research in the Arctic a difficult endeavour? Uh, what makes <laughs> research in the Arctic difficult? Great question. Uh, the cold, I think, first off, is is the cold and the impact that has both uh, on you um, and bits of you freezing and also on the equipment freezing. So uh, days um, where you can't feel your hand when you're getting a uh, frost nip or frostbite, your skin's freezing, uh, you feel terrible uh you've got both the ache of a minus 40 and the sting of uh sort of hard snow being blown into your face um which is i mean it feels like you're being sandblasted in the face or stabbed with a fork repeatedly uh <laughs> you can't feel your hands <laughs> you're sort of ending up with you know chronic nerve damage in your yeah. fingers um so all that makes life quite difficult <laughs> and then there's the, the equipment side Stuff breaks as it gets colder. Um, lot most of the stuff you use isn't designed for use um, in the Arctic, so things break. We've shredded two pla uh, plankton nets mm. on this trip. Um, we've had uh, sampling uh, Niskin bottles, so sampling bottles uh, freeze solid on the back of the boat, and had to melt those open either by using a kettle or dunking them back in the ocean. Uh, so it's definitely the cold. The cold mm. makes stuff tough. Makes everything slower harder more likely to go wrong yes you mentioned the the pain of it as well i think people maybe don't really you think when you get cold you go numb yeah but it's not that is it it's you uh, go numb to start off with but then there's a whole other level of very very sharp pain i mean i think so i mean i think that um just uh when you are holding stuff up um or working with your fingers i don't know where the pain comes from maybe a dog doctor can tell me at some point it does feel like the, the blood drains from your hand uh, and the cold at the same time. Um, it's just an, it's like someone's inserting sort of metal rods down the tips of your fingers. Um, it's like it's a, yeah, a skewer, just like, you know, it's inserting it gently or, or not that gently. Um, and so, yeah, it is. And, and but if you're working scientifically or, or doing filming work, you just have to get the shot or you have mm -hmm. to do your job. So you just crack on. And you also mentioned about being sandblasted. It feels like being sandblasted. Yes. And that's because partly it's because it's so dry up here. Because actually this is, we're in an, what's known as a desert. It's an Arctic desert because there's so little rainfall. Although in recent years there's been a bit more rain, hasn't there? There has been. But I mean, when you get um, snow blown around, uh, it stops being those wonderful, beautiful flakes and turns into sort of gr uh, sand-like grains. Grain. And so it's basically ice grains. Mm. And so a lot of the snow you get, I mean, this was in the Canadian Arctic, is blown snow. And it is this the sort of like sand, ice grains. Um, and so, yeah, that's being whipped through very by painful. a very strong wind. Um, and along and with that, that dryness, you also get very dry skin, very dry eyes, dry lips. Um, it's all just, even um, we should mention the static as well. Yes, I mean the great thing uh, this this year is that my normally my fingers um crack and open up, which is um mm. really pleasant. 
and horrible. Uh, and we've got lots of lovely static up here. Uh, so you're constantly getting electric shocks. Electric shocks. Everything, uh, everything anybody touches that you get the little crack or spark. I saw a good one. I saw a spark. With, it was like a proper spark between the end of my finger and the fridge. I was getting some milk. And that was exciting this morning. Lightning spark. Lightning spark. Yeah. And Kerry as well, Dr. Kerry Lewis, who's uh, our lead, lead scientist up here. She's particularly susceptible to static. And her, her hair sort of goes all staticky. Um, and everything she touches is little crackles. And so you've got to try and not be too close to her otherwise she'll spark something and then you get it as well yeah interesting place to be isn't it um right so another question from inem uh, what inspired you to do science or what inspired you to do your job up here uh i think that the i mean the natural world inspired me to do science mm. i think i think it's awesome i was one of those kids with little jars of wood lice and millipedes and that kind of thing in my bedroom uh, and I had a wonderful book called The Avatar Naturalist um, by Gerald Durrell, which is mm, uh, fantastic. Um, sadly, I think I'd, I'd have print now. Mm. Uh, and, and then being my parents, um, we holidayed um, in Scotland and enjoyed the, the highlands of, of, of Scotland and the old Caledonian forest. So, so that really, that love of nature. And then that was sort of um, squashed um, somewhat by my schooling when I was told that I had to do proper subjects like Latin and physics um and maths and and so i sort of went okay well that's you know mm. that that was just a sort of a time and then i got stuck in a tent in the arctic with with a bunch of uh, very very wonderful scientists including kerry who's who's up here at the moment and realized how little i knew about this planet um, and they were telling me about the ocean and since then have been working with scientists around the world um, helping to share their message with young people. Brilliant. So you found your way back to the... Found my way back to the... To the not quite the jam the jars. jars. But now we've, we've got jars of copepods instead. Now we do have jars of copepods, but they have been, they get fixed. We won't talk about <laughs> fixing things. <laughs> but it's it's very true. It's, it's a definite... Um, it's a real shame that all children tend to be naturally inquisitive. This is something that David Attenborough says, that every child will look under a stone for worms when they're little, and you all go out and explore in your garden. And you don't have to go to far-flung places. It's, you know, on holiday with your parents. Yeah. It could just be local area in your back garden. Children are naturally curious, they're naturally inquisitive, and that ultimately is the basis of science. It's trying to find out how things work and what things do and why, and watching and observing and writing down your observations. So it's a shame that certainly, you know, in the past, sc traditional school systems sort of divide subjects up and tell you which subjects are the right subjects or the wrong subjects. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's changing now. It does seem to be getting a lot better now where schools are teaching interdisciplinary subjects. So the Arctic is, is what are we teaching? Geography and biology and chemistry and a little bit of physics. There's, there's everything involved here. And of course, you could say international relations and politics as well. Um, so it's important to try and keep that curiosity alive as long as possible well definitely i think that uh for, for some reason or other that subjects like biology and geography which help us to understand our, our world um were seen as uh, lesser subjects because mm. they had the reputation for coloring stuff in and drawing diagrams um which i think is a real shame yeah it is yeah um whether well, they are wonderful robust and academic subjects um like, and, and and fantastically interesting and full of adventure mm. and weirdness <laughs> and weirdness is key and it's worth also knowing as well hearing your story that you can come back into science so if you do love history and art and drama and um, languages and English you could go and study those at university and, and you could go and get a degree in, in something completely different it doesn't mean you can't then be a scientist as well or later on in life so you can still find a role in communicating science you can still it be involved yeah. in scientific research um, and of course as we both are doing um, sharing those stories of science with people around the world like you next question um, this is a good one from Camden School for Girls hi again thanks for coming back and joining us again uh, and they are wondering how many different projects are happening at one time at our base so maybe at our base and then in Neolisund as a whole so at the UK Arctic Research Station there's not only normally sort of one or two a project at, at any one time and those are spaced throughout the year 
that's really just due to capacity here. It's not one of the biggest stations mm. uh, in Neolosund. So, but typically what you get is uh, earlier in the year, you might get people who are looking at glaciers and want them to be really frozen. Uh, a project I was involved in for a couple of years, we we're looking inside a glacier and it's always good if it doesn't melt and fall apart <laughs> when you're inside it. Uh, then this is a great time of year for marine research. So um, it's not a great time for being out, out and about because it's in between the cold and then the easier sort of warming summer. And then during the summer, you might get people going up to the glaciers and doing some microbiology. Uh, and you might have people looking at some of the life around here, particularly the bird life um, in the summer. So there's a whole um, range of different types of research that happen over the year. Other stations might have visiting projects. They might also have long-term monitoring projects. And that might be long-term monitoring of a glacier, mm. might be long-term monitoring of the atmosphere, um, or of the marine environment. So those projects are here for longer periods and also mean that some stations are, have permanent staff or have people always always coming up. And, and what's the purpose of a long-term? Why would you choose to do a long-term monitoring project as opposed to just coming in coming I, once? I think, I think all scientists would love to do a long, long <laughs> especially when you're looking at the changes in the natural environment, love to sort of get that, that sequence um, over, over a, a, a series of years. Because then you, you can look at a trend. Um, you might come and look at something one year and it might be, oh, wow, you know, we come up to um, uh, Neolison on, on the 8th of May and we look out and there uh, are 28 um, icebergs here and it is minus 20. And we come out the next year and there uh, are no icebergs and it's plus 2. And you might say, oh, well, the Arctic is warmed by, you know, mm. how many And you degrees. don't know which one's the norm. No, and so looking at something over, over over a series of years understands that so you have that natural variability but you can see where the trend is is it is Overall it, trend, is it yeah. general trend to smooth out that natural variability mm. more years are good yeah and talking about international uh, research when we do have you say normally one or two projects on our base but when you are sharing the base with somebody who's doing a, a different project it's really interesting because it might be something that's totally different so science is such a huge broad term um, uh, last year we were here with at the same time as a team who were studying the the glaciers and they were flying huge great cameras that were hanging off helicopters so it was these sort of 50 foot long beams with very specially specialized detection um, called ground penetrating radar. So this is something that is almost an X-ray through the glacier, which shows the layers of ice in the glacier. And they were flying this helicopter up and down and coming back. And so in the evenings we could gather around the laptop and we could look at some of their scans of the insides of these glaciers. And that's absolutely amazing to be able to share those results as they find them. You know, we, we could see the scientists coming back after the day's work, all excited because they got some good data. In the same way they see us coming back all excited because we've got some plankton data from our nets. And that's really unusual to be able to share a completely different discipline um, over a cup of tea in the evening. So it's good. It's a good place to be. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, OK, what's up next? We go back to INEM. Ah, here's a good question. Have yeah. you ever been to Colombia or South America? Uh, Quite different than here. Briefly, I, I'd love to, to do more projects in South America. I very briefly I got stuck in the bottom of Chile uh, for a week uh, waiting for a lift down to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we came up via um, Buenos Aires and uh, Rio de Janeiro because we wanted to see those on the way back. So mm -hmm. it really was a stopover um, on the way from London to Antarctica. Um, so we'll have to come and visit properly. Um, maybe do a project in Colombia. Yeah, is that is that a, an invitation, IMEM? <laughs> is that we can come and say hi, can we, at your school? That'd be great. Great. Colombia Live. Why Perfect. not? Perfect. <laughs> we'll do that next year. Um, and another question from the same school: Are there any expeditions in winter? Uh, there are lots of expeditions um, in winter. Um, if you're asking particularly um, up in the Arctic. Um, there, are, there is research, as I mentioned before, that goes on the whole year. There is a very cool project um, starting called Mosaic, um, mm. which is a, um, a polar ship, uh, the Polar Stern, um, which is being frozen into the into the sea ice and scientists visiting and working from that 
uh, throughout the year, um, so through the long polar winter as well. But uh, normally it's a smaller team, um, places like Neolosund or other polar bases during the winter, but very much yeah, expeditions happen during the winter as well. Of course, you're not going to be doing the same type of science. You're not uh, necessarily going to be able to travel mm. in the same way um, during the winter as you can in the summer or even in the spring. And having to cope with 24 hours of darkness instead yes. of 24 hours of sunlight, so quite different. Very different. And let's just explain about this mosaic. This yeah. this ship is going to sail into the, into, into the ice. Into the ice. And then the ice will freeze around it and lock it in place. Yep. And it's going to get stuck there. Yeah. And, and then, then be a be a research base. And be a research base, and they'll, they'll they'll resupply. I think by plane and by helicopter. Amazing. And how long is it going to be? I think it's at least a year. Wedged there in the at ice. At least a year. Fantastic. Um, so we'll see. Depends how the ice behaves, of course. Mm. Mm. Um, so fingers crossed for a year. There's some brilliant uh, old black and white photos of of previous polar expeditions where ships have got stuck in the ice. Um, not on purpose, uh, and, well, and on purpose, and, and on purpose sometimes, yeah. where they've had to, you know, do an overwinter and, and ration out their food, and they've had to kind of come off the ship and make igloos and things. So, it's uh, to me, it kind of it conjures up those same images of being trapped in the ice. Uh, but it's it'd be interesting to see a, a very modern version of that. Yeah, I, I think that that's very true. I mean, the the most uh, famous expedition to. Uh, have a boat designed to get stuck in the ice mm. and, and prove the idea of polar drift as well as try and reach the North Pole for the first time was the Fram expedition mm -hmm. uh, in the 1890s led by um, Fritjof Nansen. Um, and uh, an amazing uh, feat. They, they went up and they took food, I think, for six years, mm. uh, five or six years. Imagine and to, packing that. And to leave home, um, not A, not knowing when you're going to return, but also or, thinking that the expedition, yeah. we come up here for two weeks, but think about you're away. Uh, for three or so years. Potentially three or four years, yeah. And if you are ever passing through Oslo, there's a brilliant museum, the Fram Museum there, where you can actually see the original Fram. Just tell us what you what you felt when we went into that museum and you saw the I was, Fram. wow, I was just properly goosebumpy. I mean, it was just it was an amazing museum. It's astonishing. Um, and to, to think that people lived on that boat um, stuck in the Arctic ice um, for a number of years. Mm. So class trip to Oslo, maybe. <laughs> ask, ask your teachers for a school e trip e to Oslo. Easier than the Arctic. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, another question from INEM. Yeah. Uh, tell us an anecdote from this expedition. Tell us, an <laughs> tell us a story, Jamie. <laughs> tell, tell, tell what's, a... what's happened on this expedition that you can tell us about? Uh, all, all kinds of things. All kinds of things. I, mean, I think that uh, what, what really comes across in, in this expedition is, is the variety mm. of, of the Arctic and, and it's so special to be back and the, the, the first day you go out um, we went out um, last week about a week ago now and we got onto the um, small research boat that we use and go sort of 30 40 minutes uh, down the fjord and it was the first time when I've actually been out when there have been a lot of icebergs around and you are an iceberg watch and these things because you're you when you when you're doing your sampling you stop um but the wind's still blowing and you're putting down your sampling things and these these icebergs are just being blown blown towards you and there's one which was heading for us uh and you know and but we did didn't we just had to mm. cross fingers and and it passed a very very big very distance very close very big distance away from us, um, so I think probably um, the the length. Is... So if I was the iceberg and you were the boat, about that far, that distance just came past you. Um, and so and that Jamie was getting a little bit concerned. Well, was, there was, was an element of concern. How close the iceberg was getting. Um, and and so I mean that bring, bring, brings home the fact you you are, um, you know, you're working uh, somewhere where you think, oh, I just put some few nets in the water, but. Um, there are obviously um, some risks to working up here mm. and challenges as well. And every day, as you say, every day is different. So we've yeah. had really rough seas with really choppy waves spraying over the yeah. boat. And we've had pristine, like almost like a lake, beautiful yeah. calm. And we can see all the birds. We've seen blue whale, yeah. beluga whale, yeah. minke whale. Yes. I haven't seen any reindeer. This. Oh no, we have seen reindeer yeah, down on the stacks of reindeer down lots there. Lots of reindeer down really, there. Really, really funny reindeer. Uh, so it's uh, 
yeah, this, this is, is a good this, this, this is not what you should laugh at in terms of the Arctic. Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening with us live on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so uh, reindeer um, hoof through the snow to get down to the plant life underneath. Uh, sort so of that, dig through. Um, so they're down on the, the shore down this way. Uh, but with the warmer days, we've had a couple of warmer days. So the surface of the snow has melted and then during the night, the non-dark night, uh, has frozen again. So these areas are quite slippy um, ice. So sort of layer of sheen of ice on the surface. And so <laughs> then these reindeer are going along doing the sort of Arctic thing. And then they're also coming off the ice and go, whoa, whoa, and slipping around. Um, you it's quite look, it is quite funny. Um, you can see from where the dining hall is, there's a, there's a big glass window so that we can have our meal and look out. It's the best view of any dining hall in the world. You can look out onto the, the fjord and, the, and see the glaciers. And it was quite fun the other evening having our dinner and watching these reindeer sort of walking along and whoop, slipping and a leg would go out and another leg would go and sort of and then the, the second reindeer would come along behind and he'd go as well so they were sort of sliding about all over the ice yeah poor things poor things um, and sticking with a wildlife theme we've got a question uh oh, i've lost it on here from um alicia from igs yep uh have you seen an arctic fox and i know you're going to be pleased to tell this yes story. um so uh the uh, it used to be an Arctic fox that was around and about, especially by the kitchen um, and the mess hall, and wonderful hall mascot for the sort of um, for life up here, uh, especially um, in the sort of earlier in the year when I've been up here in March. Very very sweet, uh, mm. we Arctic fox. Uh, last week uh, we were talking to some people here, and they said very sadly that a um, baby reindeer had died. Uh, Possibly because it uh, there's been some rain and it couldn't couldn't get through that ice couldn't go we through the ice um, to food below normally it's just snow which is easier easier to get through um, and then the the carcass of the baby reindeer um, had not yet been eaten which implied that um, no predators there were no predators around uh, and so then we thought that the Arctic fox was dead as well very happily to say that we found out that the Arctic fox is alive and well and in fact uh, peeing on some sample steaks <laughs> um, to one of the glaciologists here said yep the Arctic fox is definitely definitely, de definitely here uh, <laughs> marking his territory mar mar marking territory by peeing on my sample steaks um, so great to see the Arctic fox it was really lovely to see again because we thought that you know we've been told well nothing's eating the reindeer so the, the fox must be gone and we were all very sad about it last week and then we were up late one night and um, talking about the midnight sun because it's 24 hour daylight here so you get this bright sunshine at night it's just the same as this and it's a weird phenomenon to sort of go outside at midnight and you look at your watch and think it's midnight and then the sun is there and it's all a bit funny so we went outside at midnight to see the midnight sun and that's where we saw the arctic fox scampering across the um Across the snow so we all had a bit of a cheer and it's a good little midnight visit yes and uh, made us all very happy we slept exactly. very well that night yes. didn't we okay so then moving on we've got all kinds of questions coming in oh and we've got a message from Colombia saying it'd be lovely if we came along to visit them so we're more than welcome oh, perfect great. there we go let's go let's go done we'll go from here we can fly yes. down <laughs> from the Arctic uh, Camden School how long do scientists spend in the Arctic at any one time um, and then also, how do they cope with homesickness? Uh, so uh, it really depends on the type of project you're working with. So it can be a number of years or it can be uh, a short uh, amount of time, such as this trip where we're just here for a couple of weeks. So it really depends on the project. And I'd say it's on average between sort of three weeks and, and, and sort of four months, probably, mm -hmm. um, sort of average uh, field time. Uh, and... I imagine that different scientists cope with homesickness um, in different ways. Certainly, uh, it is easier to cope with being away from home um, when there is beautiful weather, uh, when it's horrible and manky and you can't get out. Yeah. Um, then you really um, start to think about home more. As from from my point of view, if it's if you're out and you're busy and you're doing things and it's amazing Arctic and there's wildlife and there's wonderful people to work with then certainly the homesickness is easier to bear. But when you're, you're 
you're trapped inside by weather or darkness or whatever, mm. uh, I think then that the, the homesickness rears its head uh, mm. more more often. Mm. Uh, I think it's this keep keeping busy. I think is what most people um, say is just you know uh, keep keep busy and keep your mind off. These Especially things. with the twenty four hour daylight, because the day can either fly by very quickly or it can seem to last four days because there's no beginning or end of the day. So if you if you keep busy, you can just kind of get through your work and then suddenly you realise, oh gosh, it's, it's 10 or 11 o'clock at night or midnight or 1am and you didn't realise. Um, and then and then you can sort of crash and, and go to sleep. Um, whereas if you're indoors all day, like you said, it sort of drags on, but there's no end of the day either. So that's when you really feel time sort of slowing yeah. down. It's a bit of a weird phenomenon isn't it bit of a weird one yeah and talking about sort of being trapped in base of this bad weather there's also this we were talking last week about this really strange dual feeling here of this massive expanse of the arctic you feel this real sense of space and freedom the air is fresh the air is clear you can see for miles and miles yeah. so you feel very much out in the open wilderness and yet you can't really get into that wilderness well, I mean, you can't just go for a walk. So, so your your movements off off the base are very organised. So you'll get ready for a day of going out on the boat and doing your sampling. You'll get a little kit together and radios and everything else, and, you, and you'll go out. Um, but it's, you don't, you can't really just go go for a walk. Mm. I don't fancy going for a walk. I mean, I, I went down to take some photographs towards midnight last night. And it's going to find my warm gloves, going to find a big jacket, getting the extra bit of clothing on. Making sure um, you've told everybody where you're going, what time you're going to be back, taking a radio. Yeah, so so doing 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 all those things as well. Mm. And then putting your time for signing out. So I'll be back by whatever time and signing out and signing out a book and doing the radio. Going and down. You, you have to be back by that time, otherwise everybody gets worried and then they start setting into motion all of these emergency responses because if, you, if you're not back when you say you will, then they start going out to find you. So you can't just sort of decide, I'm going to go off for a wander or have a bit of a moment on my own, go and spend an, an afternoon up in the hills or anything like that because you've got to have your rifle or you've got to have your polar bear training. Yeah. So although it's really expansive, it can feel a little bit... Claustrophobic. Claustrophobic yeah. sometimes. Unusual kind of dichotomy there. Uh, what have we got coming up next? Oh, Daniel from IGS would like to know if you've been in the water at all. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably uh, sensible. Very, very sensible. So the, the water here, um, so uh, seawater freezes at about minus 1.5, 1.8 degrees um, Celsius. Um, so below the freezing point of uh, pure water, and so jolly, jolly cold here. Uh, the air temperature is even even colder, so it's about minus 10 at the moment. Um, and so we don't actually need to be in the water, and I'm not going to go for a recreational swim um, <laughs> at these temperatures. Um, it's a long time since I've swum around bits of ice, um, and so I'm not going to repeat that. Mm. Uh, that was definitely a head head freeze moment. Mm. Um, when you just, you, yeah, your brain just goes to mush, as far as I'm concerned. And the pins or needles in, in your feet. When I came out, yes. I remember pins or needles yes. on feet. Uh, that was that was pretty pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but no, there's no scientific reason, no recreational reason, uh, as far as I'm concerned, no reason whatsoever to be <laughs> in the water. I'm going to keep it that way. There you go. That's told Daniel. Yeah. Um, John T would like to know if global warming has had an effect on where we are. John T, uh, great question. Um, it would uh, be interesting to have been coming here for uh, a longer period of time, um, but certainly um, what people have seen here, uh, two main uh, impacts, three main <laughs> impacts of global warming, one a more recent one. Uh, the first is the reduction in sea ice. So if you saw the fjord out there um, earlier uh, in this broadcast, that dark water, uh, that would have had sea ice over it and certainly sort of a bit earlier in the season you could have driven a tractor across that and the last time I think there was sea ice across the whole fjord uh, was in 2005. Uh, the second impact is the retreating glaciers uh, mm -hmm. so these glaciers are moving back there's an island just over here which they thought was a headland because it was joined to the to the mainland uh, by a glacier but that's now receded all the way back and they've worked out it's an island uh, and then the third point um, is, is the amount of rain. So it's raining more 
Um, I've had rain um, in March, early March, up in the Arctic, um, with you know rain normally have sort of plus temperatures, so it's plus mm. one or plus two, and raining in March, um, which is very surprising, and and seeing more rain uh, throughout the year, mm. um, and and also especially early, earlier in the in, in the season. Um, and the rain, as we were mentioning before, with rain during the fox has a big impact on wildlife up mm. here because it creates this layer of ice which makes it very difficult to get for animals to get through, to get mm. to food, and whether that's um, grass and moss and, and, and lichen or food caches um, for an arctic fox. Mm. It's completely changing the, the food webs and the, the biology, the, the kind of lifestyle of lots of animals here, because what if you're below freezing, whether it's minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, cold is cold and it's dry and... You know the animals are very well adapted here, so they can survive in that. We we find it harder, but the the animals that have been here for all these years are all, well, all you can, right. You can just tug up. Um, mm. you, you know, you can just put on warm clothing, and mm. with dry cold, it's it's, it's, easier, it's easier easier to work with. But now that the temperatures are fluctuating around that zero, and they're sort of bobbing up and down above and below zero, that sort of changes all of the the habitat really for a lot of animals, as you said with. With this ice layer changing people's uh, changing animals ability to to get mm. food and forage so it's really it'll be interesting to see over the next years how that shifts um you know feeding patterns and habitats and routes migration routes things like that um of, of the animals up here and talking of shifting um shifting wildlife and biology yes. i've got a question from i think it's adara in from camden school do we both believe in evolution I don't, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I'm struggling with this because of the word believe. Yeah. Um, and, and it comes down to uh, whether that is the, how, how you approach scientific evidence and scientific mm -hmm. th um, theories. And does that come to a, belief is almost something that you accept is uh, true or untrue. Um, without evidence, regardless of, re regardless of evidence. what the world says, yeah. Um, and so um, when you see the evidence uh, deduced, is it still a belief mm. Um, mm. system? Mm. Uh, so I'm just, uh, I mean, yes, I think that evolution is how uh, life on Earth has developed. And I'm 100% I'm, I'm in with that. And I think there is very, very strong uh, <laughs> evidence in the fossil record mm -hmm. um, and um, looking at the DNA as well to back that up. Uh, I can't think of any better idea about how that um, has occurred. Somebody may come up with a better idea in the future. Mm -hmm. That is the glory of science. And that's that's what I was about to say. I think that the, good, the great thing about science is that it is flexible and is responsive. So as new evidence comes out, um, you know, the scientific thinking will shift to incorporate new uh, evidence, new ideas, new theories that are put forward, and a new theory may be considered and then rejected or accepted based on probability and likelihood. So um, at the moment, all of the the evidence we can see the most likely, the most probable scenarios for you know why we all stick to the Earth instead of floating away was probably gravity. Um, you know, Firm belief on gravity. <laughs> why uh, you know why water is hard sometimes and liquid other times. You know, probably to do with, with states of matter and, and physics yep. and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, yes, in, and, and the evidence for evolution is, is very, very uh, broad, diverse yep. and supported in lots of different ways and re repeated in lots of different ways. Um, so it, it's very different things than, than, than belief in other things and in, in, in other ways. So, so I, I'm persuaded of the benefit benefits of the scientific method as a way to look at the world mm -hmm. and how um, the world works and it's incredibly useful it can't answer all questions um, so you know why are we here um, I don't think science answers particularly mm -hmm. well uh, but in terms of how uh, life on earth has evolved I think it's got pretty good answers mm. and I think it's important to remember that science is not supposed to be providing all the answers and doesn't have to provide all the answers and it's very important that scientists don't think uh, or get sort of lulled into a sense that they do know the answers. And actually, as a scientist, a good practice in science is saying, we don't know. Yep. And that's where belief in whatever you want to believe comes in. We don't know this, 
Um, so believe what we will. And then he, here are the things that we do know. So I think it's, uh, it's good to be open minded as a scientist and always ready to accept new information and new possibilities. Hope Brilliant. that answers Thank your you. question. It's a good question. It's a good debate to have, yeah. definitely. Um, Jamie from IGS. Good yes. name. J Jamie. This Jamie. <laughs> Uh, Jamie oh, from Jamie's, IGS. Uh, hi, Jamie. Strong name. Strong name. Yeah. Uh, would like to know what tools do we have? <laughs> uh, what? It's a good what, one. What tools do we have? Where's the uh, shovel? The shovel's back in the in in in, in the storeroom. Shovel as well. Uh, so the tools we use for our sampling, uh, just to sort of, sort of you know, narrow in on 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 that. Before I do that, actually, you have to have a lot of tools up here because you have to be able to fix stuff because you can't just go and get another one. So fixing stuff. So we've behind the camera here are chisels and files and pliers and spanners and wrenches and hammers and all that kind of stuff. And duct tape. Uh, and like duct tape, yes. Um, so <laughs> fixing stuff is is something that you, you really have to do here. And it's really good as well because you're not just throwing away. I think that a lot mm. of people just tend to throw away things if, they, if it's broken. So, so the, the fixing culture, um, make do and mend is really strong up here. Um, but in terms of equipment, we've been using uh, tools we've been using for our science, two main tools. The first is a what's called a Newston net. And that's a sort of like almost uh, like an elongated um, uh, mesh net um, about um, three meters long. And it has a sort of a container at the end and you drag that through the water and that collects the plankton and plastic samples and the second thing that we have is a niskin bottle that's like a section of drain pipe with elasticated ends that snap back Very you clever. lower it to the depth that you want to take a water sample from um, on a winch off the back of a boat and then you send a weight called a messenger down the wire and that hits the end and snaps the ends closed and then you know you're only getting a water sample from that particular depth. So those are the two main tools we use for our science. Very clever. Niskin's very clever, isn't it? Yeah, a good Niskin. system. It drops yep. and closes and you've captured your little sample of water. And we should say about the netting, this isn't the kind of net that you might find like a fishing net. It's very, very fine. So the nets we've been using are 40 microns. For, 40 microns. 40 microns. <laughs> 40 million. A micron is... A millionth, millionth of a meter, of a meter, so or a thousand, very, very th fine. thousandth of a um, millimeter. Millimeter, so very, very, very fine mesh, which um, the water can get through, but tiny, tiny plankton can't. So you've got to go very small if you want to catch capture very small things. Yes. Right, got a couple of minutes left, so last okay. couple of questions. Tabitha from IGS wants to know if your hair has ever been frozen. Uh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> So your hair does get frozen, uh, all the moisture, especially you breathe out sort of hair around. Especially when you've here. been out in the Antarctic for a while and got a big bushy beard. Bushy beard. Uh, uh, friends have washed their hair in the Arctic and that freezes um, and it almost feel like you can snap, snap it off. It off. Um, but it freezes in, in great sort of positions. It's normally like a th thin film, so it's just like sort of you can just move it around. And so it's like ha having a bucket full of sort of hair gel in terms of movability. Uh, and you get snot calls, um, which is rather disgusting. It's because your nose runs when it's cold. And you just icicle get of ice, snot. icicle of snot coming off your moustache. Um, classy, um, mm. but, um, but very painful to get off. But there we go. There's some horrible little... <laughs> Polar facts for you. No problem. Lovely image of Lovely Jamie image with of his snopticals. Anyway, there we go. So <laughs> a new a new word for you. And uh, we were talking about fixing things and, and repairing things. Yes. Um, and it's a good way to live up here, um, to be quite conservative with our usage of things. Um, Emily from IGS wants to know what we do with all our waste. Uh, all our waste. Um, so we there are a number of things that happen. So first of all, the recycling is incredibly... Um, <laughs> I know detailed here. So there's 17 different types of recycling, um, and that's all in the dump um, up at the service building. Uh, quite often you will, and there's also for timber and metal scrap. So we've got to have a scrap yard uh, mm -hmm. for timber and metal scrap uh, and building waste. And so then you can go up there and we'll use, if we need to wait for something, then we'll mm -hmm. go and use something from up reuse there. Reuse as so much as you can. Very much a reuse policy. Um, and then for the waste here, it's sorted and then it's it's taken out by ship um, and then treated 
um, incredibly carefully and as much as possible is recycled. I don't know the complete endpoint of the waste management system, um, but I know it is something that we pay a lot of de detail and, mm. and place a lot of importance on to minimise our environmental impact while we're up here. It's a good way to live up here, actually. It's quite um, meaningful, thought through. And if we if we all lived in the same way in terms of our reuse and fixing and mending, you know, if you get a hole in your socks, you mend them, you don't buy a new pair. In terms of our waste management and in terms of, you know, not using, not leaving the tap running, um, rationing your sort of water and energy use. What do you think, if, if we all live like that, is it too much or is it impossible? No, I, I don't think it's impossible at all. I think it's just a, it's just, it's habit forming. Mm. Um, and very, you, you come back from this type of trip and you don't leave the tap running. Um, you just, uh, to, to wash a mug, you just have a wet sponge and you just mm. wash your mug without a running tap and then you rinse it perhaps to get, get that mm. off. I think we already do. I think, you know, things like mm. a dishwasher is in fact more energy, often more energy yeah. and resource efficient um, than washing things by hand. But I think you the make do and mend the fixy the fixy attitude, and I think definitely when I um, encounter friends in the maker movement and who are who are making repairing, designing things to be fixed, mm. um, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Pre-loved and pre-used and reused, it's all yeah. it's all part of building it into your behaviour. And it's true that even just within a couple of weeks here, you pick up, you shift your behaviour, and then that continues back at back at home. So. We, we could all try doing it wherever we are for a couple of weeks and then see if it sticks. Well, I think there's just this, I mean, make, do and mend. Mm. Um, I think there is, a, I, my gut feeling is that stuff um, universally is weirdly cheap. Mm. Uh, I don't think Shouldn't we, be. I don't think we value stuff enough. Um, place more value for stuff. So on that note, I'm going to head back behind the camera to, to finish us off and you're going to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm going to head round because it's Brilliant. unfortunately out of time. Well, thank you very, very much for being part of this Arctic Q&A um, as part of AXA XL Arctic Live. In just over an hour's time, I will be smashing up an iceberg with an ice axe <laughs> to investigate sea level rise. Um, and... Then we, after that, um, so in just over three hours time, we have an interview, expert interview uh, with Ellie, who will be talking about her work as an adventurous science communicator. Until then, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you so much for sending in all your questions. And it's a big goodbye from us up here. Bye bye.